Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy, happy Sabbath, Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. We have another great lesson. This, these lessons in the book of Genesis have been excellent this quarter, and this one bears the same. <clears throat> bears the same. It's, it's a great study. So we're going to get into the roots of Abraham. <clears throat> and our memory verse um, is, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So before we talk about Abraham not knowing where he was going, mm -hmm. David, would you like to pray for us? Oh, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Our loving Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Father and Holy Spirit in heaven, we just come before you on this Sabbath day because we are so thankful. It is your faithfulness, Lord, that allows us to worship you. It is your faithfulness that allows us to have that eternal life, the assurance of it with you. It is your faithfulness that guided Abraham to be the father of faith, Lord. And we're just thankful that we get to learn all this and have the Holy Spirit help us apply this in our lives. Lord, we ask that you give extra blessing to Daniel, uh, to Barbara and myself, so that we can speak the truth through the Holy Spirit. We also pray for the people um, that are watching, Lord. Be with them, help them, and uh, guide them, Lord. And we ask that whoever is looking for your word, that they can find it as you promised. Again, Lord, thank you. Please forgive our sins and listen to our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So as we look at this, this set of lessons and as we get into Abraham, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on Abraham. And as David prayed, he is known as the father of, the, of, of faith. And he had great faith. And the Bible tells us that many times in many places. But I want to focus for just a minute on God because we need to look back through this, this, this journey in Genesis at just what a relational God we have and how this relationship carries on with Abram. And so we remember in the beginning, God wanted to establish a relationship with his people. He created man, he molded man, and then he established a Sabbath, a whole day to spend with God. And, and that is what the Sabbath about, is that relationship with God. And we see that he also spent time with Adam and Eve. Every evening they would walk in the garden. And we know that because when Adam and Eve sinned and God came to, to meet them in the garden, they, he, he couldn't find them, and, and it is it because they had sinned. And then take a look at Cain. God loved Cain. He was trying to encourage Cain to follow his will and to do his rule. And even when Cain fell and sinned and killed his brother, God still protected him. So we see that God, no matter what our situation, is still there for us. Then Noah. He gave him detailed directions on how to save mankind. And he cradled that little ark so that it was safe through the flood. And then the Tower of Babel came. And God, even though in their sin, God didn't come down and destroy them all again. He did destroy a bit of the top of the, the, the tower, but he got them to go out and do what he had asked them to do, which was repopulate the earth. So now we're in the book, the center of the book of Genesis. And we're going to see how God works with, with Abraham and with Lot and, um, and through the, their journey that God has sent them out on. We'll see that Abraham had ups and downs. His journey wasn't perfect. We'll see how God led him through the, these relationships and how Despite his shortcomings, God grew him and groomed him to be the, uh, the father of a great nation. So the call for Abram to get out of his country and move away from his roots takes him on a long journey, not just to find the new promised land, 
but to find himself and establish his identity. It wasn't enough that Abraham had to get out of Babel in order to find his self, but Abraham needed to get Babel out of him. And God knew this. Ellen White says in uh, Testimonies to the Church, before God could use him, Abraham must be separated from his former associations, that he may not be controlled by human influence or to rely upon human aid. Now that he has become connected with God, this man must henceforth dwell among strangers. His character must be peculiar, differing from all the world. He could not even explain his course of action as to be understood by his friends, for they were idolaters. Spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. Therefore, his motives and his actions are beyond the comprehension of his kindred and friends. Abram's unquestioning obedience was one of the most striking instances of faith and reliance upon God to be found in the sacred record. With only the naked promise that his descendants should possess Canaan, without the least outward evidence, he followed God where he would lead, fully and sincerely, complying with the condition on his part, confident that God would faithfully perform his word. The patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He passed through wildernesses without terror. He went to idolatrous nations with one thought, God has spoken, I'm obeying his voice. He will guide, he will protect me. And what, a, what an example for us today. Are, is that where our lives are going? Are we, are we following God's voice? Just such faith and confidence as Abraham had, the messengers of God need today. But many whom the Lord could use will not move onward, hearing and obeying the one voice above all others. The Lord would do much more for his servants if they would be wholly consecrated to him, esteeming his service above the ties and kindred of earthly associations. So this is a sober, sobering thought, and it's amazing to me how God works with each one of us there's, what, almost 8 billion people in this world? Mm -hmm. And yet he will work with each one of us individually to give us direction as he did Abraham. So we see in this <clears throat> relationship um, with Abraham it needing to leave Babylon, we also need to leave Babylon, don't we? Revelation 18, 2, 4, and 5 says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So we need to think about this important principle. Are we willing to listen to God's voice? and do as Abraham did when God said to Abraham, go. When he said go, he left, he, he, he took his things and went. When he said go for his son, he took his son and went. And so as we look at, at this week's lesson, we see how his journey gets sidetracked, he fails, but yet in the end, God gives him the strength and the courage to keep going and his faith and just about who he is makes all the difference in the world. So Abraham struggles to inherit the land. When he finally arrives in Canaan, he cannot stay there because of famine. He is therefore moved to Egypt, but Abraham can't settle there either because of the conflict with Pharaoh. Abraham is obliged to turn back. He goes back to Canaan again. But even there, things are complicated. Abram and his nephew, Lot, agree to part ways because of a, a land dispute. Afterward, a war breaks out and involves the whole country, the very place that God had established Abram. After the battle, Abram is met by a stranger, Melchizedek, and we'll see what happens. That's a, that's a very interesting part of the story as well. And so as we see and walk through these lessons, there's so many rich spiritual applications for us. So I look forward to this journey through, through this lesson. 
So Danielle, tell us about more about Abraham's departure. So Abraham's departure and the Sunday's lesson is really focusing on Genesis chapter 12, <coughs> verses 1 through 9. But before we go there, uh, we really want to think a little bit and s look at some previous, like a little bit of, a little bit before in chapter 11. So one thing that we note is that the last time God had spoken with a person was a at least recorded in scripture, it was with Noah after the flood when he was reassuring him. And we see that in Genesis chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. And then the next time God is again recorded to have spoken directly is this time with Abram. Now, Abram, his birth name, so we know that he starts with the name of Abram at birth, and then eventually God changes his name. But what does Abram mean? It means father of elevation or exalted father. It kind of points uh, to the honored position as the ancestor of God's chosen people. And it's interesting how names in the Bible tended to be given that way. It makes you wonder if there was some kind of information that was passed down by God or through the Holy Spirit. Somehow he was named that exalted father. And his name was later changed by God to Abraham in Genesis 17, uh, verse 5, with a new meaning, father of many nations. But right now, we're starting and we're looking at the time when he's still named Abram as exalted father. And we're going to start looking first at Genesis 11, verses 27 to 32, which is the previous chapter before the one listed in our lesson. So we, let's read it together. Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 to 32. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah is his father, Abram's father. And it says, Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. We see the three brothers. Haran begot Lot. So Lot is Haran's son, thus Abram's nephew. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Ne then Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now we see Abram living uh, with his father from Ur of the Chaldees. Located where this is located in Babylonia, as we were talking, where the Tower of Babel had been originally built, uh, also called Mesopotamia. The area was called Mesopotamia. And you know, we know that the ruins of Ur have long been um, known under the modern name, uh, archaeological name, Tel El Mukayar, which is, means it's one of the tells that's been uh, heavily uh, dug and researched. It's situated about halfway between Baghdad and the Persian Gulf. There have been extensive archaeological excavations in this area, and the well-preserved ruins uh, show that the city possessed an exceptionally high culture. Houses were well constructed and usually were two stories high. Rooms on the ground floor were grouped around a central courtyard uh, and a staircase laid up, led up to the second story. And the city had an efficient, efficient sewer system, which much more than some of the cities in that same area uh, have today. Um, in that country, you know, it, it, today is much more mm, rural in some of those areas. In the schools of Ur, reading, writing, arithmetic, and geography were taught. As the many schools exercises, they have found a lot of ex classroom exercises, documents uh, that they've unearthed in their archaeological studies. The inhabitants were Aramaic Chaldeans, tribes closely related uh, to the family of Terah, and both were descendants of Arfasad. So 
Abram's youth, we already see that he had spent it in a highly cultured and sophisticated uh, city as the son of its wealthy citizen. Um, and without doubt, he was a very well-educated man. The religious life of Ur was polytheistic. Um, and Joshua states in Joshua 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 2, that Terah, Abram's father, had served other gods in Ur. So we can see not only the area was, but even in his own family, uh, they were polytheistic. So it is a miracle that Abram remained untouched by these pagan influences surrounding him. Now, at first, let's read the text. You know, when we were looking at verse 31, it says, And Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and they left, so to speak. So it makes it sound like Terah was the one that made the move. However, scriptures make it clear that Abram was the one to whom God revealed himself in Ur of the Chaldeans. So let's look together at, uh, in the New Testament, Acts 7, 2 to 3, so we can see. And it's, so here it is. This is Stephen. Uh, as before he is going to be martyred, he is witnessing, and he's talking to those around him, uh, waiting to stone him, and he says, And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. This is one text. So obviously, even though the text in here says, and Terah took his son Abraham, we are told in Acts 7.23 that the call was given to Abram while he was still in Mesopotamia. And Genesis 15:7 confirms that. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chal Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So again, here is an underlining that the call was given to Abram in Ur before he left to Haran. And then in Nehemiah 9 with 7, you are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. So we can see clearly here, now God reveals himself to him. And you know, even though although Abraham was the one to whom the call came at Ur, he still lived under his father's roof. So there's a good reason for the text saying, Terah took his son out. Uh, Terah evidently consented. It shows Abram's influence. And as the, but the, as the head of the house, he led the move because he was the patriarch alive. He had to be respected as such. Oriental propriety would have required Terah to be given credit for acting as the head of the house. It would seem most inappropriate to say Abram took his father out of the country. Like in the text, if they would have written that way, it would have been almost insulting. So they couldn't. But the texts that we have in the New Testament are clearly to telling us. So we can see that the first call was given to him, to Abram, in Ur. And then he moves with his father. And then our story begins. So let's read together Genesis 12, which is our text in the lesson. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. In verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with, Beth with Bethel on the west and I on the east. 
There he built an altar to the Lord and called the name of the Lord. So Abram joined going on still toward the south. Now, uh, as we can see on here, the call came to Abraham in two, two different um, time periods. But as we, he got to this country, he, 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 what does he see? Um, first of all, he, he sees that the country is not his. The, the Lord has sent him there, but he is not at this time inheriting the country. He's occupying, but it's not his. The Canaanites, who are polytheistic as well, land, uh, live there. But the things that we notice the best about Abraham is begins, his call begins with a command. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. Continues with a promise to a land that I will show you. Obviously, God must have specified Canaan as the land. I will make you a great nation. Abram's compensation for leaving family and homeland behind is announced and ends with a blessing, both physical and spiritual. But what does this have to do with us? I stop to think uh, what might have been God calling him to leave and what God calls us to leave behind. What uh, have I already left behind and what he has left behind? and what I'm still to leave behind. We're to ponder these things in our mind as we are contemplating this move of Abraham. Thank you, Daniel. Now, David. Yes. Abra Abram had a temptation, and that was called Egypt. Do you want to tell us yeah. why, that, why that came about? You know, I really like this title because the title is, the temp it's a Monday's title, The Temptation of Egypt, but I can say The Temptation of the World. Okay, the temptation of, uh, you know, job, temptation of and Satan, or temptation of our heart. It is very applicable to us. So the story actually is uh, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, from verse 10 to verse 20. Um, if I read it, um, they, uh, you know, we'll run out of time, but let's just go through the story. So there is a severe famine, and Abraham in this case, not told by God, or asking God, what should I do? Being on his knees, he decided to go to um, Egypt. Now, Egypt is a land of water, a lot of food, and people actually, um, because of the abundance of wealth there, people generally uh, don't need God. And also Egyptians, when people go there from the land of Canaan, they look down on them. They don't look at them as um, equal to them. So there was there is a lot of problems, but Abraham nonetheless decided to go there. As he was getting in, he saw that, oh, there might be a problem. You know, my life might be in danger. So he tells his wife, Sarah, you know, Sarah, you know, you're my wife, but you're also my half-sister. And I think, you know, my life is in danger. So why don't you do this? Do us all a favor and just tell them that you're my sister. And when that happens, you know, maybe they'll spare my life and I'll be okay. And uh, here we see that God blessed Abraham, but Abraham did not believe in God's blessing that he will be father of many nations. So he was afraid of men. So here Sarah listens and be obedient to Abraham, actually tells a lie, violates the Ten Commandments, and at the same time, um, Pharaoh is very excited. He gives Abraham dowry because he feels like, oh, I'm going to you know, marry this person. So it gives a lot of uh, wealth and and Abraham doesn't say anything. But again, we know that where things look really dim, really sinful, God always comes in and steps in. So God has a plan because we know God promised to Abraham that we will have a savior coming through his seed. And that plan was about to be derailed. So God um, creates this huge plague in Pharaoh's home. And Pharaoh comes to Abraham and says, why did you deceive me? Why? And what's interesting is that I don't know if I were deceived by somebody and I did something wrong. I probably blame that other person. But here, Pharaoh, he rebukes Abraham because he deceived him. But at the same time, he takes responsibility. And he actually gives Sarah back and lets Abraham keep all the dowry, all the things that he gave Abraham and all the things that Abraham also had. Instead of getting them by force, he lets him go. And he actually believes in God and believes in God's uh, sovereignty, which is so interesting because we know 
that God um, has had a relationship, has a relationship with Abraham, and we expect something like this uh, from Abraham, like this type of reaction, like Pharaoh showed. You know, um, it is the story is really about story of God's faithfulness and how we are to respond to God's faithfulness. It's also a story about our journey. Our journey of faith is not a one-time event. It's not an event or task that we do check off. It's actually a relationship, and it develops over time. And that is important. The biggest, the, the, one of the important things that I actually um, take, took away from this lesson is the difference between temptation and trial. And I feel like, you know, we need to have that differentiation so that we don't forget to call on God when we're faced with the decision or with the challenge. You see, temptation is a thought that can generate from our heart, and it can also come from Satan. But what happens is, anytime we're faced with a decision, we, if we don't keep God as our priority, we, if we don't ponder whether my decision will glorify God or not, we will fall into temptation. And temptation is designed for us to fail. Satan wants to show God that, hey, you know what? This person says he loves you, but he really doesn't. And this is the proof of it. On the other hand, if we make a decision and put God first, then what happens is that God gives us the strength to go through trials. And trials are designed for us to increase our faith in God. So that's really important. I wanted to read Patriots and Prophets, page 129. The Lord, in his providence, has brought this trial upon Abraham to teach him lessons of submission, patience, and faith. Lessons that were to be placed on record for the benefit of all who should afterward be called to endure affliction. God leads his children by a way that they know not, but he does not forget or cast off those who put their trust in him. The very trials that task our faith most severely and make it seem that God has forsaken us are to lead us closer to Christ, that we may lay all our burdens at his feet and experience the peace which will give us in ex exchange. You see, when Abraham walked with God, he left his motherland to come to the land of Canaan. And he, um, he trusted in God, and he brought blessing. He's supposed to be, bring blessing to everyone. But here, he did not walk with God. It became a temptation to him, and he left from Canaan, where God wanted him to be, and he left to the land of Egypt, and he became a curse to Pharaoh's household. So let me give you 10 quick points. See, when God gave Abraham to leave his family, Abraham did, but he allowed Lot to come with him. So he didn't f truly, fully obey God. And we know what happened with Lot. A lot of things Abraham had to endure. Also, you know that um, Abraham was a commandment keeper. We know that. But that was proud, not enough. God said, you know what? Get out of your country. Follow me. See, we cannot keep the commandments without following Christ. And what is keeping the commandments is to love one another with all our hearts and minds and soul. You see, Lord's Prayer, this is interesting, Lord's Prayer has one commandment built into it. It says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are, to to uh, we are told by Jesus to forgive one another. And also, Lord's Prayer has one no request, that is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What that means is that when we when we are led astray by our thoughts or by Satan, God, uh, please help us. We don't do that. And if we do, please also protect us. And that's exactly what did God did with Abraham. We also learned that we are not to tell half lie or half truth. A truth with deception is a lie, and it can be. It, it is always bad. It's like Laudation Church, where neither good, neither bad. We're kind of like lukewarm, and God does not like that. And then we see that God used Pharaoh to serve his purpose. He can use anyone. So as Christians, we are not to actually, um, you know, ignore anybody. Also, God can do his work in any situation in the midst of famine. For example, Isaac faced the same situation, 
but he stayed in the land of Canaan, and he was prosperous. Also, we know that self-preservation, self-gratification is an ungodly behavior. If you read um, this one verse, which is so interesting to me, uh, what, um, what um, uh, uh, Abraham did, he told Sarah that um, verse, um, verse 13, 12 to 14, it says, Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you leave. Please say, You are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. I may live. He already forgot that God already gave him eternal life through his promises, through his blessing. So, self preservation. We should remember what Jesus said. There is no greater love than laying down your life for somebody. And that is important. See, in the end, the question is, what must we do to have eternal life? You know the story of the rich ruler? The young man came and said, you know, how, what should I do? I keep the commandments. Jesus says, self, sell everything and follow me. Jesus was telling the story of Abraham to that young ruler. And he's telling us the same story today. And Daniel mentioned this. We are to ponder and we are to see what we need to do. Let's follow Jesus in the life of Abraham and learn to be faithful. Thank you. So it sounds like God's growing Abraham's faith as he travels, doesn't it? So we're going to talk about now about uh, uh, Abraham and Lot. And Abraham now, and we're going to be looking at Genesis 13, 1 through 18, but I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to talk us through from uh, because there's so much scripture here and there's so much richness in this so Abraham is coming back from Egypt and with him is Lot and they they enter back into um, the, the the promised land and he ends up in Bethel he gets as far as Bethel now what do, do we remember what Bethel means house of God house of God and he places his tent there and so Abraham and Lot um, have their own separate uh, flocks, their, their tents, their, their families, their herds. And the land just becomes too small in that area. And so there becomes strife between the household of Abram and the household of Lot. And especially amongst the herdsmen uh, where the livestock was concerned. So... Abraham is the one who takes it upon himself. He doesn't wait for Lot to come to him. But Abraham goes to Lot and says, I don't want to have this strife between you and I. Our relationship is more important than, than, what, than, than to have all of this strife. And he goes, we've got this whole land before us. So you choose. Lot, you choose first. What do you want? And it's important to look here at, at this because Lot chose the best. So you can see where Lot's, Lot's mind is. Okay, well, I'm going to get the plain. I'm going to get where, where there's beautiful rivers so that, my, so that I can be wealthy and I can, I can grow. And so this is, this is Lot's mindset. And Abraham says, fine, go. And so they separated from each other and uh, spread out. Now, Lot um, went and pitched his tent near Sodom. And this is going to become important later on. But Sodom was a very um, perverse city, if you will. And it was, it was not a, a city of God at all because there was, it says, exceeding wickedness against the Lord. And so we see this exceeding wickedness. And so it's, I, I want to read verse 14 because verse 14 says, And the Lord said to Abraham after Lot separated from him. So it was after they had, had stopped their strife that the Lord came and, and talked to him. And he says, Lift your eyes now and look from the place you are, north, south, east, westward, for all the land which I give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants 
could be as the numbered. Arise and walk through the length and width that I give you. And so it's, it's amazing because Abraham's generosity and his, his um, just who he was, his, his being, um, is what God made God give him, um, uh, give him this promises. And um, the promise goes on in Genesis 12, 3 and 4, and he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. So Abraham departed as the Lord spoken to him, and Lot went with, and, and this was when he first left, and, and Lot was, was with him as well. So as we look at the differences now between Lot and Abraham, we can see um, from uh, what Ellen White has to say in Life Today, the Holy Scriptures give us marked examples of the exercise of true courtesy. Abraham was a man of God. He pitched his tent. He at once erected his altar of sacrifice and God and invited God to be with him. Abraham was, a, was, was very courteous. His life was not marred with selfishness, so hateful in any character and so offensive to the sight of God. And so we saw this with the way he handled the strife between he and Lot. Also in uh, Conflict and Courage, she says, the Holy Scripture gives us marked examples of exercise of truth. Oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked sinners and exceedingly before the Lord. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. And so we see that Sodom were wicked men and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. The, the most fertile region in all of Palestine was the Jordan Valley. There were cities also wealthy, beautiful, inviting, profitable traffic in their crowded marts, dazzled with visions of worldly gain, Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evils that w he would encounter there. He chose for him the plain of Jordan and pitched his tent toward Sodom. How little did he foresee the terrible results of his selfish choice. Lot chose Sodom for his home because he saw there were advantages to be gained from the world's point of view. But after he had established himself and grown rich in earthly treasures, he was convinced that he had made a mistake in not taking into consideration the moral standing of the community in which he was to make his home. And so we see that, <clears throat> we see later on with Lot that by making this choice, he put himself in a truly precarious situation and he ended up <clears throat> um, having to flee that city. We also see the character of the antediluvian world here and the and the chaos that, that um, he had. So in contrast, Abraham's move was an act of faith. Abraham did not choose the land. It was given to him by God's grace. Unlike Lot, Abraham looked at the land only at God's injunction. And only when Abraham separated from Lot that God speaks to him again. And I, I, find, I found that interesting when we read, read that scripture. In fact, this is the first recorded time in the Bible that God speaks to him since he was called at Ur. So this is, he, he had, there'd been a lot of, of territory that Abraham had covered here. And so this is when God showed him the, that whole area that he would have and made him his promises. So God invites Abram to walk on the land as an act of appropriation. Arise and walk through the land, its length and width that I give to you. The Lord, though, makes it very clear that he, God, is giving Abraham. It is a gift, a gift of grace, which Abraham must appropriate by faith, a faith that leads to obedience and the work of God alone that will bring about all that he has promised to Abraham. And so we see this through this, this situation <clears throat> that 
the differences here between Lot and Abraham. So we have choices too. Are we making choices for Sodom, for things of this world, for the riches, the worldly gain, the pleasures of this world? Or are we going to God and saying, I will take what you give me, I'm ready to go. So that's something that we need to, to think about in our lives as well. Beautiful. So David, no, it's no, Dan Danielle, it's Danielle not David, Danielle. You're going to talk about the Babel Coalition. So the Babel Coalition, <clears throat> sounds interesting. <laughs> this is the first war narrated in scripture. It takes place after Abram's return from Egypt and after Abram and Lot have separated uh, with a clear indication of Abram's humbleness and reliance on God's uh, promise of blessing and Lot's exact opposite, example of greed, taking the most fertile valleys of Canaan, um, but close to Sodom and to uh, trouble, so to speak. It also happens after three uh, royal um, brothers in the area had come and reached out to Abram and formed a coalition uh, to support each other in this clearly uh, violent and oppressive land that they were living in, Canaan, called Canaan at this time. And Abram formed this coalition with these three local kings for us to, to join together to protect each other. Um, so let's start reviewing the text of this first war. Uh, I'm going to speak through it a little bit as we read. We're starting in Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13 first. And it came to pass in the days that Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eliezer, Sherdolomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. He was the ruler of this king coalition, <coughs> Sherlomar was, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So we have these kings led by Sherdolomar coming to fight these Canaanite kings. All these joined together in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Uh, twelve years they served Sherdolomar. So they obviously were defeated, and for twelve years they served Sherdolomar. They paid taxes to him and tributes. And in the thirteenth year, they rebelled. It took about one year for them to organize themselves. So in the 14th year, a year later, Sherdolomar and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim and Ashtarim, Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Imam in Shever, Kirithaim, and the Horites in their mountain of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So they're coming and they're just attacking the whole Canaanite territory. Then they turned back and came on Ed Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazion Tamar. So we can see what effect it had up upon the local population that these kings decided to rebel. I mean, who suffered? The people. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Atma, the king of Zeom, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sidim against Sherlamar, king of Elam, titled king of nations, and all the other kings that were with them. We're not going to read all their names again. Now, in the valley of Sidim was full of asphalt pits. Now, that's like tar. And that's, they say that this uh, area is now covered by the southern part of the uh, Dead Sea. And they say that tar still rises to the surface in that area. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. At that time, it was land. It wasn't covered by this, this, the Dead Sea. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. So some of them died, some of them escaped running to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eskol and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. So here comes the news. So we see what's happened here. As the story says, these four kings uh, uh, versus, uh, attacked the, five, the four allies, attacked the five Canaanite kings, and they were victorious. And they took prisoners of Sodom population and Lot with them. 
Now, we have just uh, read the, this information and we see that uh, we're going to the part that's interesting to us about Abram. So let's read Genesis 14 verses 14 through 17 where we see where Abram comes into the story. So here it is. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants. So 318 trained servants from his household who were born in his house. No, not only were they from their house, but they were born in his house, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided the forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh after his return from the defeat of Sherlomar and the kings who were with him. So the interesting part, I like the way Ellen White uh, presents the setting. So let's read uh, the uh, writing in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 135. Abram, dwelling in peace in the oak groves of Mamre, up in the mountain, so to speak, in the hills, learned from one of the fugitives the story of the battle and the calamity that had befallen his nephew. He had cherished no unkind memory of Lot's ingratitude. All his affection for him was awakened, and he determined that he should be rescued, seeking first of all divine counsel, Abraham prepared for war. So when we have read this text, uh, we can see that Abram, some very interesting things. Uh, although this story refers to a specific historical conflict, the timing of the war, just uh, after God's gift of the promised land to Abraham, gives this event particular significance. And ironically, the camp of Abraham, the truly interested party in this land, given to him by God, did not participate in the war for this land. And why was that? Why was he not involved? It's because he had not won this, this land by war or by diplomatic diplomacy. It was a gift from God. It was for God to protect uh, this land for him. Um, but the only reason he intervenes is because he is Lot, his nephew Lot is taken prisoner. And we can see in Philippians 2 to 4 his mentality. It's like we are told, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And that's exactly what he does without a moment. Despite what he says to, to his wife in Egypt, it seems like he's grown since then. And he just takes up arms and he takes his coalition of three uh, kings that he had made an agreement with and they all go and fight and God gives them success in battle. And the interesting thing is when we're looking at him uh, and we see, we see a few things about him, that God has been developing this man and blessing him. He's rich in faith, uh, noble in generosity, unfaltering in obedience. I mean, he had made some mistakes in Egypt, but he's obeying. Uh, and humble in simplicity of his life, the way he was living in Mamre, wise in diplomacy, and I mean, he didn't just go alone, he pulled those kings. Brave and skillful in war. I mean, he went there and he divided uh, themselves at night. He had, they attacked at night, divided themselves, and went from three directions and uh, destroyed them. And then he even followed them for 40 miles north to make sure that they're not gonna be able to regroup and come back. And then he comes back with everything. He's righteous and he's not a coward in maintaining the right and defending the oppressed. That's really what God was developing him to be, and he is definitely becoming just what God had in mind for him. And it's interesting how God does the same thing with us when we follow and obey. He develops us in what he has in mind, and we become something that we could never be on our own. Thank you. Now, David, this is one I'm excited about. Yeah. The tithe of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek we don't see very often in the Bible, do we? No, no. So tell us about him. Well, thank you, Danielle, for going through this so well. Uh, what's interesting, too, is that Abraham fought against his own uncle, Elam, mm -hmm. was um, the son of Shem. Right. And, so he, and then he had a coalition with his uh, cousin, Canaan's children, the mm -hmm. two. You know, so here he comes to this cursed land of Canaan, 
and mingles with the people have coalition mm -hmm. and fights against his own family. Yeah. It's very interesting to me. Now, so the Melchizedek appears after Abraham wins that battle. And when he appears, he comes out of, you know, it just, just, he just comes, shows up. Now, the question is, who is this Melchizedek? So, you know, Abraham just right now, you know, went to save Lot. And he actually fought for somebody named Sodom's king Bera, which is mean in evil, and Bersha in wickedness. And he wins. But he doesn't accept any gift from these people because these people are deceivers and they're wicked. They, if Abraham accepts gift from them, then they will say, hey, because of my gift, you are wealthy. But we already know God is the giver of all good things. So here he is, but suddenly... Abraham goes to the Valley of Kings, you know, and they all want to thank him, celebrate his win. Here comes Melchizedek. Melchizedek, this is the first time in the Bible the word priest is mentioned. Priest of God Most High. Melchizedek, when he blesses Abraham, we'll read that. He calls Abraham of, Abraham, uh, of God the Most High. Same, same referral. So Abraham and Melchizedek believes in the same God. What's interesting here is that after Abraham wins this battle, which is really, uh, like Daniel said, kind of first war going on, it doesn't feel good. But now comes the priest of God. God initiates, again, relationship with Abraham after the war. And he comes and he talks to Abraham. And um, we know that Abraham met at the Valley of Kings. To me, I was talking to, uh, you know, earlier um, among ourselves, and to me, this whole incident kind of represents the end times, where Abraham has been the remnant. He's the remnant. Melchizedek represents Christ. He, his name, his title, is the just king, and he comes from the city of peace, Salem, which is the precursor of the city, Jerusalem. So here, Abraham, we're following the, you know, God's desire and having faith in God, only with 318 people goes and um, conquers these, uh, these um, people. And now Melchizedek comes in and he blesses Abraham. Let's look at his blessing, Genesis 14, 19 and 20. He said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed uh, who has... Uh, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, he, and he gave him the tithe of all. So, uh, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, Chapter 14, by Mrs. Ellen White says, It was Christ that spoke through Melchizedek, the priest of God, the most high. Melchizedek was not Christ, but he was the voice of God in the world, the representative of Father. And all through the generations of the past, Christ has spoken. Christ has led his people and has been the light of the world. When God chose Abraham as a representative of his two, truth, he took him out of his country and away from his kindred and set him apart. He desired to mold him after his own model. He desired to teach him according to his own plan. So here we see that messenger of God who did not have any genealogy represented Christ of that time but not Christ and he was a priest to them and he was a priest to Abraham and he anointed Abraham see when Abraham realized that Melchizedek is God's priest the most high Abraham accepted the gift that he brought he brought wine and bread and we know bread and wine represents Jesus's word his body and his blood represents his uh, atonement for us so uh, here Abraham accepts the gift he accepts the blessing he accepts the anointed anointance by the Melch by Melchizedek who actually came from God represented God to him so what does he do to show his love to show that God loves him, that he appreciates God, he gives one-tenth of all. And the word all here means God is the creator of all things, heaven, earth, under the earth. So Abraham 
actually, by giving tithe, expresses the sovereignty of God. And again, uh, Mrs. Ellen White says that the tithing system reaches back beyond the days of Moses. Men were required to offer to God gifts of religious purposes before the definite system was given to Moses, even as far back as the days of Adam. In complying with God's requirements, they were to manifest in offerings their appreciation and mercies and blessing to them. This was continued through successive generations and was carried out by Abraham, who have tithes to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. See, the same principle also existed in the days of Job. Now, I always wondered how the, did Adam and Eve, before the sin, paid tithe? Everything was perfect, right? Then I, re I realized it was the Sabbath. is a way of showing gratitude to God. And if you look at it, in a week, there is 168 hours. And a Sabbath is 24 hours minus 7 hours of sleep. That's 17 hours of spending time with God. 17 divided by 168 is 10% of our time in a week with God. So for me, when Abraham gave all that he had to God. It's not just the wealth, it's also the time, and it's also everything for people that he, you know, he was in the land of Canaan to represent God. It's the ambassadorship, right? It's the ambassadorship. So uh, James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Doesn't that seem like Abraham? He came out of, when God called him, he came out of uh, that land and he showed gratitude towards God. He was there to help Lot. He was forming coalition, like Daniel said. He was there to sh represent God. We know that even in Egypt, he might have, you know, not been truthful, but God did reveal himself to Pharaoh. See, and even in the worst case scenario, Pharaoh learned about God. So this is amazing. So this Melchizedek, is a very important character, not just for Abraham, Abraham for, for us, but it's pretty much the character that's been slain at the beginning of the foundation of the earth. It was Christ who always kept his faithfulness. He always initiated his love first, and he always gave us that, that heirship, the ownership, that relationship, the, the place in heaven with him. And we, as people of God, have to appreciate that. And tithe is that. Tithe is that. It, tell, it identifies us as the children of God. You see, when Israelites had the tithe, um, they gave tithe, they also at the same time were blessed with grain and wine. So when we get blessing, tithe is not our gratitude only to God, but it also the gift of God. It is the gift of God that's in our life. Take it as a gift, not as an obligation. And then things will be different. You remember the song? It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. See, let's look up to Jesus, show our gratitude for all that he had given us by giving him of one-tenth of all we have. That includes our talent, our time, and our wealth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Danielle, do you have any final Yes, yeah, so thoughts? as I was spending time on uh, the first lesson on Sunday, and I was uh, looking at them uh, living, and the things that happened in Haran, Terah's death, and yeah. so on and so forth, and Nahor living, staying behind. So really, the most terrible thing that happened in Haran wasn't Terah's death, but it was really Nahor's decision to stay behind. Uh, he and his family voluntarily separated themselves from, the, from God's promises by refusing to accompany uh, Abram to the promised land. Uh, as a result, they and their descendants finally vanished from the stage of history while Abraham and uh, his posterity remained for centuries the recipients of God's special favor and the channel of his blessings not only to Abraham, but to us and the entire world. So Nahor just uh, by choosing not to follow. 
And that is the exact point where we are looking at the situation and we need to realize that the same thing that happens to Nahor, that happened to Nahor would happen to us if we don't follow the Lord. Um, you know, the command, you know, to Abraham, as we were studying in that chapter, there was a command to get out. To Nahor, Nahor followed to part of the way, and to that command was a promise uh, that the, God, Lord, the Lord would lead them to the land, that he will show the land where to go, and that they will be, he'll be blessed. Uh, and the blessings are enumerated there. We have to look at things the same way uh, and realize that the call that God makes to us when we are become, deciding to follow the Lord and is the same way. We are to make decisions like Abraham, to follow the Lord without any reservations where he leads. Uh, whatever is going to hold us back from our decision to the Lord needs to be left behind, and we need to move forward like he did and not stay with Nahor. Uh, the Lord will lead us just as he led Ab Abraham, and the Lord will bless at the end. But the only way to reach that blessing is by following all the way. It wasn't easy for Abraham to leave, but it was easy for him to leave because he knew the Lord was leading, and that's how we have to look at it too. Thank you. David. Yeah, I just <laughs> wanted has to remember this temptation and trial. Every day, every decision we face, this is the struggle, this is the controversy. Whether we put God first, or we put our own desire, or what Satan puts in front of us. And that James chapter 1, verse 14 uh, to 17, we need to remember that. And we need to be on our knees. And this Abraham story is about the story of the remnant people. And since Jesus is coming soon, this is, the, this is going to be a big issue for all of us, temptation versus trial. Yeah. And we need Jesus. And we need to be on our knees. We need to keep that Sabbath as a gratitude for God. We need to go out there and love people as a gratitude of God. We need to really realize what the, ten, what the Lord's Prayer is saying. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you. I, and I have two. I have two final thoughts. <clears throat> you know, uh, David, when you were talking about tithing, yeah, and how tithing goes back um, to before Moses. Mm -hmm. Every one of God's principles in the sacrificial system, in the law, mm -hmm. goes back. Mm -hmm. I mean, throughout this lesson so far, we've seen we've seen thou shall not kill with mm -hmm. Cain. We've seen honoring your parents. We've seen not having other gods before us. So every one of those commandments we've seen throughout Genesis being broken. So that law was there mm. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as we, as we delve into to the, the book of Genesis and we're getting now further into it, we see that God's is the same today, yesterday, and forever mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to these. The other thing that I think is important for us to realize is that we, we, sometimes when we look at these Bible characters like Abraham and all of the faith he had, Abraham wasn't perfect. No. He failed numerous times. But what we see with Abraham is his life going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we need to hang on to today. We may fail. We may slip. But as long as our life is moving closer and closer to God, he understands that and he continues to work with us and bless us. And so that to me is comforting in the life of Moses. Or, nice. not, not Moses, Abraham. <laughs> in the life of Abraham. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this lesson today, Lord. We pray that we will be like Abraham in that we follow you wherever you you send us wherever you lead us that we will listen to your words and no other words lord that when you um, bring something to mind where we have struggled or we have failed lord that we will earnestly turn back to you and turn away from that which is evil so father we're thankful for the sabbath we're thankful for this lesson and we're just thankful that you love us and we can always depend on you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen.
Have a wonderful Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, happy Sabbath. Thank you.